if you hear the Marseillaise on this show, it can only mean one thing. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Horsepower Heritage. I'm Maurice Merrick. Today, I've got a special episode for you because we're celebrating 100 years of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, a race meant for production cars and run on public roads, and one that welcomed amateur and professional drivers alike. The first event began at 4 p.m. May 26, 1923. 37 cars started that race, and 24 hours later, 34 of them had finished. A remarkably low rate of attrition given the punishing conditions that the race would promise to deliver year after year. The wear and tear on the cars, the eye-watering fatigue on the drivers, who endured the roasting heat of the day and the chill of the night as well as hailstorms and thunder showers and impenetrable mists blanketing the course. And in the wee hours of the morning, crowds of spectators are all asleep in their tents and the drivers are struggling to keep their edge as they hurtle through toward the dawn. There are a century's worth of stories. My guest today is Richard Williams, and he tells many of them in his new book, 24 Hours, 100 Years of Le Mans. Richard spent many years as an editor and sports writer at newspapers like The Guardian and The Times of London. But he's been in love with motorsport since boyhood, and he's the author of five books on subjects in racing history. Now, with a massive subject like Le Mans, there's so much to talk about, and I knew we were barely going to scratch the surface. But I hope you enjoy it, and really, this will whet your appetite. So if you want to pick up a copy of Richard's book, there's a link in the show notes. It's terrific. And don't forget to follow Horsepower Heritage on your favorite podcast app. Leave me five stars and a quick review and tell your friends about the show. And I've got some other great racing episodes coming soon, so be sure you're following the show so you don't miss them. But we are just days away from this year's 24 Hours of Le Mans, so this episode should get you excited. Lots of great stories from 100 years of racing. And that's coming up right after this. Hey guys, here are three scale model exotic cars you can find right now at ModelCitizenDieCast.com. First, it's the 1974 Lamborghini Uraco. Second, a Lamborghini Countach 25th Anniversary Edition. And third, a 1992 Bugatti EB110 Supersport. Three great exotics to start your model car collection. They're all in pocket size 143rd scale, so they're easy to display just about anywhere, from your desktop to your dashboard. Go to ModelCitizenDieCast.com and use the promo code HPHERITAGE to get 10% off your order. Limitations apply. From race cars to street cars and everything in between, it's Model Citizen Diecast. Because your inner child still wants to play with cars. Richard Williams, the book is 24 Hours, 100 Years of Le Mans, and it's a fantastic read. Uh... The pages turn very quickly, especially if you are really into this stuff like I am. So thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I couldn't really sleep last night. Believe it or not, I was dreaming all night about Le Mans. <laughs> I, was, I was actually doing laps last night in my sleep before this. Do you know the whole circuit? Can you do that? Can you do that in your... Yeah. So, you know, out of the pits, uh, under the Dunlop Bridge, up to Turt Rouge... The and then into the chicane before right. the bridge, yeah, chicane, right? And then uh, you're it's a right hander into the Mulsan Strait, yep, down to the very, very sharp Mulsan corner. Don't hit the overrun yep. like Moss did, yep, at 170 miles an hour, yep, when his brakes faded, yep. And then let's see, we uh, were winding down to Arnage, Indianapolis, then Arnage, yep. sorry, Indianapolis, then Arnage, yep. And then coming round again toward Maison Blanche. So you're doing the old circuit? <laughs> yes, Maison the old Blanche. circuit, yeah. Good. Yeah. And then um, and then up uh, once again into the uh, pit straight. Yep. Well, nowadays, of course, you'd have the Porsche curves and then the Ford chicane before the pits. That's right. And uh, also, Mulsanne is not... Uh, you'd have the chicane. You know, now, now we have the chicanes yeah. there, yeah. So what's your best time in your dreams? <laughs> oh my goodness. I don't, <laughs> probably about 15 minutes. <laughs> but uh, no, I, honestly, I was dreaming about 
Lamont all night long, I think, and um, just anticipating this. Of course, it didn't help that I was reading the book until midnight. Oh, um, I'm very but tough. it's a marvelous book, Richard. Really, it's so entertaining, and I really mean it. The pages turn quickly. I'm very pleased to hear that because I was worried about that because there's so much detail in it, and I thought, you know, are people going to be all right with all this with this level of of detail and you know, the, my, I mean, it's 150,000 words. My first draft was 230,000. Uh, so I had to cut 80,000 words out to make it, you know, kind of manageable, re- really, for the reader. Um, anyway, that's very nice of you to say that. You've been a sports writer most of your career, right? But auto racing is a different animal, isn't it? It is a very different animal. Uh, it's something I became involved with in childhood. Uh, I was taken to my first motor race in 1959 when I was 12 years old, um, and that kind of got me hooked. That was a day at a small circuit in England called Mallory Park, and I was lucky enough that day uh, to see a young Scottish driver, quite unknown, called Jim Clark, win four races in a single day, three in a Lister Jaguar and one in a Lotus Elite. And he really was unknown at the time. But I did turn to my dad with all the wisdom of a 12-year-old and said, Dad, I think one day this chap Clark is going to be world champion. And I was right. Uh, <laughs> you were indeed right. <laughs> and so I, you know, I, I grew to love motor racing. And um, I was already actually following it before that. And Sterling Moss was my first big hero, uh, worshipping uh, but I loved all kinds of other sport as well. I loved football and uh, rugby and cricket and tennis and, you know, all kinds of things. So eventually, after 20 years of working mostly as an editor, uh, I became a sports writer um, quite late in life, but that's what I then spent 30 years doing. So I could indulge my uh, interest in motor motor racing as well as in all the other sports as well. The book, decade by decade, the story unfolds. Fortunes rise and fall, both of people, but also marks, and by extension, the nations that produce those cars. The other thing I really enjoyed was you really paint an excellent picture of sort of this temporary society that rises up at Le Mans over the long weekend campers and parties and jazz bands in the 20s and the infield carnival and church services and you know sometimes terrible accidents and deaths but it's sort of like the human story all there on the weekend amid the roar of the engines that's been there right from the beginning in fact the origins of le mans go back to the very first grand prix in the history of motor racing in 1906 uh, when the local automobile club bid to host the first French Grand Prix, the first Grand Prix anywhere, and they won the bid, and they held it over a, a long circuit. It was about 70 miles long to the east of the city of Le Mans, um, not using any of the roads that are part of the, the circuit for the 24 hours. Um, but that was quite a success, and you know it, it took on... Already in 1906, an element of a sort of festival, you know, there were flower festivals and there were bands and all sorts of things. And they ran special trains down from Paris with special tickets and so on. So that was quite a success. And then it went a little bit quiet because they discovered that they couldn't make very much money with a circuit 70 miles long because you can't, you know, plenty of people can go and watch it for free if that's what you're doing. Um, you can't barricade it all up. So it wasn't until after the First World War in 1920-21 that they started holding races again on a much smaller circuit this time, um, on a 10-mile a circuit just to the south of the city. Uh, in fact, you could walk to the circuit from the center of, of Le Mans, um, and they could build grandstands and barrier that off and charge admission and, uh, and make some money. And the first um, big race they had on that circuit in 1921 was another French Grand Prix, 
and it was won by an American in the Duesenberg, as you probably know. And then two years later came the first 24-hour race. And the French makes dominated very early. Of course, I've said before on the show, if the Germans really invented the first motor car in the Benz Patton motor wagon, then the French really were the first to make love to the motor car. And there were so many different French cars. Well, uh, it's very interesting that the, the plans for the 24-hour race were drawn up at the annual Paris Motor Show in 1922. And it was a meeting of three men. Uh, a man called Georges Durand, who was the secretary of the uh, Automobile Club de l'Ouest, the organizing committee of, of Le Mans. Uh, Charles Farou, who was a journalist, but a kind of man about motor racing. And a third man, Emile Coquille, who was the French representative of the Roger Whitworth Wheel Company from Britain. Uh, and Coquille wanted to create some kind of an event that would put to the test Rudge Whitworth's new quick-release hubs. You could change wheels and tires very much quicker than before. Durand wanted to uh, organize some event, a new event, um, too, and Farou was a kind of impresario in a way. So uh, they got together over a cup of coffee at the Paris Salon de l'Automobile, at which there were stands for 81 French motor manufacturers, 81 different makes of car, all from France. That's astonishing. So it was a good environment for them to cook up their, their scheme. And eventually they came up with this idea of uh, the 24-hour race on a closed circuit with very strict regulations that would do two things. The plan was to improve first the motor car itself, uh, its performance, and very significantly, its reliability. And second, to improve the quality of French roads. Um, Georges Durand had got his start in a working life by joining the Department of Roads and Bridges of the Department of the Sartre, in which Le Mans is uh, situated. And he was very concerned to, that French roads should be improved. I mean, they were unmade at the time. Um, there was not much tarmac around. Even at the beginning in 1923, you know, the road, uh, the, the, the road in which the 24 hours was first run was very rough indeed. So they, they were, those were the two real concerns. And um, it was for road cars. It wasn't for racing cars, unlike the 1921 Grand Prix, which was for pure racing cars. The 24 hours would be for fast touring cars, cars you could buy and use on the road. So... They stipulated that they had to have hoods, which had to be shown to be in working order. They had to have mud guards. They had to have lights that worked all the time. They had to have, very importantly, self-starters. Most cars in those days were started by a handle, crank. But Georges Durand and the uh, committee of the ACO insisted on self-starters. So the car had to be started on the self-starter before the start of the race and then at every pit stop. And, uh, of course, it had to have a working battery. And there was a great limit to what parts you were allowed to replace during the race. Any parts ha that, that you that needed replacing had to be carried on the car uh, throughout the race, which limited, of course, put a big limit on what you could take. And, of course, the drivers were required to make any repairs necessary. They had they were able to be handed the tools across the pit by the mechanics, but the drivers themselves had to make the repairs. Exactly so. Um, and if they broke down out on the circuit, they had to cope for themselves. They were you know, they couldn't send a mechanic out to, to help them. Although they could send a mechanic out to shout instructions, but not to give them any any practical uh, help and certainly not to pass them any new parts um, or a, a shovel to dig themselves out of one of the sandbanks. But, of course, all these things did happen uh, quietly and sometimes under cover of darkness. And of course, the other stipulation was they had to carry a spare wheel and tire with them. So, you know, if they had a simple puncture, they could change that. And there are some interesting stories about drivers finding creative ways to make a repair, especially with the car being so distant from the pits, like commandeering bicycles, for example, and surreptitiously adding something to their kit. 
Yes, uh, a popular addition was a, a shovel um, because the, the, the right hand, the, the, the quite sharp right hand bends around the circuit, like at Arnage or Tetra Rouge, had sandbanks on the outside. So you ran into the sandbank in the early days. Uh, and digging yourself out uh, was sometimes the work of several hours, and you had to do that unaided. There are some marvelous photographs in 1954 of an Italian nobleman called Count Innocenti Baggio, um, a man who had no prior racing experience at all, but was um, sharing a Ferrari GT with the Dominican playboy Porfirio Ruperosa. And uh, Baggio started the race and pretty quickly put it in the sandbank at Tex Rouge. And he was wearing a white alpaca suit black leather dress shoes and a shirt and tie at the time. And he did have a shovel. And it took him so long to try and dig it out that Ruberosa walked around from the pits, which was, you know, about a mile, uh, with his girlfriend, the Hollywood actress, Zsa Zsa Gabor. And they stood on the sandbank watching poor old Baggio. They couldn't help him, weren't allowed to. Nobody could help him. And eventually he had to give up. The car was just plugged in this sand. And that was it. The race was over. And there were lots of examples of that uh, kind of thing. There's a story about Tony Brooks, the Formula One driver in the 1950s, young Englishman, very good driver, who got his Aston Martin uh, stuck upside down in the same sandbank as Baggio. And uh, he was stuck under the car until the Porsche of Umberto Malioli came along around the same corner, ran a little bit wide, swiped the Aston Martin and fortuitously knocked it off Brooks. So Brooks was, was then freed from underneath this car, which was, you know, dripping petrol on him. So the sandbanks gave rise to lots of adventures. By the way, your story about Baggio illustrates an important facet of Le Mans, which is that professional drivers, factory drivers were racing right alongside gentlemen drivers and amateurs. And the power and the displacement of the cars was wildly different. You'd have a tiny little Gordini racing right alongside the big Maseratis. Oh, yeah. 750cc to 7 litres in, in those days. And, and there's an, an element of that persists, as does the Pro-Am element. You know, Le Mans was the original Pro-Am uh, event. Um, and that's one of the things I love about it, along with the diversity of the machinery. And that's the sort of thing that's disappeared from Formula One um, years ago, unless you think an amateur driver is someone with a rich daddy. And there are quite a few of those in Formula One. Now. Um, of course, there's a long tradition of that as well, right? I mean, if you think about it, Wolf Barnato bought his way into Le Mans and saved Bentley. He saved Bentley, but he was also an extremely good driver. He was as, you know, yes. as good as any of the Bentley drivers. He won three years in succession, the first man to win Le Mans three years in a row. And that was no accident. You know, that wasn't because he was, you know, just a kind of decent amateur. He was a proper driver. And it would have been very interesting to have seen him in a, a Grand Prix car at the time, but he had other things to do. And as you say, he, he with his money, he'd save Bentley at, um, at a very difficult time. Well, Richard, I would love to talk about sort of a decade by decade uh, retrospective, if you like. The 1920s is where it begins officially, and it begins not as a single race, but they, they have this idea that it needs to be a, a triennial and then a biennial thing where if you win three years in a row, then you get the, the Rudge Cup, as the British called it. Well, the French are brilliant at inventing major sporting competitions you know they invented the world cup they invented the fo football the european football cup the tour de france you know and they like to make them complicated you know there is nothing more complicated than the tour de france except possibly uh the, the 24 hours of le mans uh, because both of them have races within races you know the tour de france has the yellow jersey for the overall winner green jersey for the points winner polka dot jersey for the King of the Mountains, the white jersey for the best young rider. And Le Mans has always had that. Uh, and it began, as you say, with the Roger Whitworth Triennial Cup. Um, it was really a means of 
when the event was brand new, of trying to ensure that manufacturers would come back year after year, that they wouldn't just try it once and then disappear. They would race the first year, qualify for the second year, then qualify for the third year. And then that would sort of be an ongoing process. Every year there would be a triennial trophy. But it didn't catch the public imagination. So they first they reduced it to a biennial event, and then that didn't really work. So eventually they had to give in and admit what everybody knew in the first place, that the real interest was you know, who went the greatest distance in the 24 hours. So they did create uh, a coupe à la distance uh, for the winner, the overall winner. But they still had, of course, they had individual classes for different sizes of cars, all the way down to very small cars and all the way up to begin with unlimited capacity. And of course, they eventually invented the index of performance and the index of energy efficiency, which were to do not with size and overall performance, but with relative performance, how much fuel you'd used, how far you'd gone compared to the size of your car. And that was quite complicated, but that gave the index of performance particularly gave a chance to the French manufacturers who had been eclipsed by the British and the Italians and eventually the Germans. And the French were very good at building small cars, small, fast cars. So that gave them a class that they could be pretty certain of winning until Colin Chapman of Lotus came along and uh, it looked like they weren't going to do any anymore. So they, um, they had to find a way of disqualifying Colin Chapman's Lotuses. Uh, in order to preserve the, the French supremacy in the in the index of performance for a while at least. As I said earlier, the French manufacturers predominated. In 1923, the winner was uh, Chenard and Walker, I believe. They did. Um, Chenard and Walker was actually one of the 10 biggest French manufacturers at the time they won the first race, but they did decline pretty quickly. Both the founders were dead by the time they won that race, and eventually they were taken over the mark name disappeared. Um, Lorraine Dietrich, another French manufacturer, won a couple of times. Uh, but Bentley won five times, four in a row, uh, between 27, 28, 29, 30. Um, it certainly established Bentley's name, but it also established the, ra the race in the hearts of British enthusiasts, uh, a place that it's occupied ever since. Um, huge numbers of British spectators go over every year. I think 70,000 will go this year out of a total of 400,000. Um, and that goes back to the Bentleys and the legend of the Bentley boys, Wolf Bonato, uh, Tim Birkin, Sammy Davis, Benjafield, uh, all those guys, who most of whom were amateurs, uh, rich amateurs, and uh, lived uh, a pretty high lifestyle. And, you know, they were in the gossip columns at the time, and their cars were, you know, big and, you know, old cars. And, uh, and they had a great charisma to them, a great glamour, and that became, that became a legend. Quite exciting days. Yes, it was the Roaring Twenties, and uh, nothing roared much louder than a, a, a Bentley Speed Six. Richard, in the 30s, Buga we see the rise of Bugatti and... Alfa Romeo at Le Mans. I'm not quite sure how interested Ettore Bugatti was in endurance racing. What Do you have any feeling on that? Uh, to begin with, Ettore Bugatti was much more interested in Grand Prix racing than in, than in Le Mans and endurance racing for sports cars. He didn't really see the value of it, and I don't think he thought his cars were strong enough, actually, for 24-hour racing. Eventually, he was persuaded, and they had great success at the end of the 30s. But before that, Alfa Romeo had come along and really, really dominated the first half of the decade um, with some wonderful eight-cylinder cars and some very, very good drivers. One of the nicest stories that I found while I was researching the book uh, was what happened after Earl Howe, the... English former uh, member of parliament and war veteran, and Tim Birkin, uh, his co-driver. What they did after they won the race in 1931, they won the award for 
overall distance, they won their class, and they won the index of performance. So they were given three bouquets. And when all the ceremonies were over, the presentations were done, they got into their winning alpha, and they drove back to their hotel in the center of Le Mans. And on the way, they stopped at the war memorial to the dead of the Great War, and they got out and they put their three bouquets at the foot of this large war memorial outside a church in the center of the city. And that gesture was witnessed by quite a number of people who were around at the time and was much admired because both Birkin and Howe had served in the Great War themselves. And that made a, a paragraph in the La Salt, the local daily paper, the next morning. And I found that while I was combing through all these columns and columns of reports. And there it was. I'm glad you told that story. I really enjoyed reading that in the book. One of the things that stands out about Le Mans is the national pride. But that story sort of illustrates something deeper than that, something deeper than mere competition. And, you know, there was an esprit de corps among, among these guys. There was. I mean, they were rivals, but um, I think you always find in in a, any sporting event that has to do with endurance that the competitors become more than rivals. You know, if you see at the end of an Olympic decathlon, for instance, these guys who've been competing against each other in all these sports – when it's all over, when somebody's won, somebody's come second, somebody's come third, and the rest have got nothing, they all gather around and congratulate each other. And it's a very moving thing. And that's because they've been through something special. And that's always been true of Le Mans. You know, I think the, the guys who, and women, uh, the people who compete in it, become members of a very special club. Uh, it's a large club, but it's a, still a very, very special one. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. Richard, I assume that you speak French, which would really help out in the research of this book. But tell me a little bit about your research process. Well, as you'll know, the literature of Le Mans is very extensive. Um, many books have been written about every aspect of Le Mans. Uh, you know, there are complete books about individual winning cars, never mind individual races or decades. I thought it's been a long time since there was a single volume history of the whole span of the race, you know, that would be readable, affordable, and so on. And I thought back to my own early years at school when I was lucky enough to find in the school library the first English language history of Le Mans written in the mid-50s by a man called Georges Fréchard, who was close to the race and to the organizers and knew the race very intimately. That was the book that got me hooked on Le Mans. And I thought, well, maybe it's time for something like Fréchard did to try and tell the whole story, to encompass the whole narrative arc. What I thought I'd do was go to the town archives in Le Mans and they allowed me in so I could look at everything they'd got. It's not the same, you know, the, the ACO's own archive has a lap-by-lap -lap chronology of every car in every race since 1923. Now, I thought if I go looking there, I'm going to disappear down a rabbit hole every day and I'll never come out. Um, but I thought I'd try and take a broader look. So I wanted to read. You're right, I, I, I read French and speak it a bit. Um, so I was able to look at the local papers, newspapers, particularly in the 20s and 30s, but also later 40s, 50s, 60s, and look for things that nobody had noticed before. And the story of Howe and Birkin at the War Memorial in 1931, that's one of them. And those stories are an absolute joy to find. That's like finding a diamond. Let's talk about some of the ladies at Le Mans. One of them that stands out to me is Odette Sico. Odette Sico was the first woman to race at Le Mans with her co-driver, Marguerite Mareuse, in 1930. Um, Madame Mareuse, who was a little bit older than Odette Sico, uh, was a wealthy woman, and she owned a Bugatti uh, in which they entered the race. Sico was a pretty good driver. She was you know, a professional. Two years later, 
Seco raced at Le Mans again in an Alfa Romeo with a male co-driver, a man uh, with the nom de, or the alias, I should say, uh, of Sabipa. And um, they came fourth, and that was the highest a woman has ever come at Le Mans. Uh, so that was a pretty impressive performance. Unfortunately, a year later, she had a pretty terrible crash between Indianapolis and Amnage, I think, and hit, hit some trees. Um, and Yeah, it was in the rain. I think right. it was yeah. quite wet. And it turned over and... Anyway, she, uh, you know, she was pretty badly banged up, but recovered. And then suddenly, lots of women entered Le Mans. And in 1935, there was a team of three MGs, works MGs, run by Captain George Easton, the famous record breaker and racing driver. He was the team manager of these three MGs, who were crewed, uh, each of them by two women who were nicknamed The Dancing Daughters, which was actually a silent movie that I think had launched the career of Joan Crawford in the late 20s. Anyway, that nickname stuck. And they did pretty well. They finished, I think, from memory, 25th, 26th, and 27th, running in formation all the way through the race. And apart from changing one light bulb, um, they ran all three MGs ran faultlessly throughout the the 24 hours. And Richard, we should point out that just to finish Le Mans is an amazing feat. I mean, you're talking about a field of, in the early years, 35 to 45 cars, depending on the year. And many did not finish. Many barely made it through the night. Yep. In 1931, for instance, I think, uh, which was, uh, you know, the a time when there'd been the Wall Street crash and so on. So the world economy was 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 depressed. There were only 26 starters and only six finished, which was not uncommon in those days, six, seven, nine finishes. Now, imagine for a crowd, you know, 100,000 people gathered, um, many of them stayed through the night and were there in the, the next day when you know, practic- practically the whole field had retired, 10-mile circuit, six cars going around. They're not coming around very often. <laughs> you know, there's not much to watch. Uh, but people still did stay. And that was one of the reasons, I think, for having the fun fair and the sideshows and all the other things, the, you know, the sort of dance floor and bands and so on, to keep people there and to keep them amused, even when there wasn't perhaps all that much to watch by, by the end of the race. But yes, it was, you know, you were only allowed two drivers uh, all the way up to, uh, to the 70s. So for each driver, you know, it was... Uh, it was an ordeal. Of course, some people tried to win it single-handed. Uh, 1932, when Raymond Sommer, a great French driver, won it in an Alfa with Luigi Kinetti, uh, the Italian-American. Kinetti hardly dri- drove at all because he was ill. Another example would be 1952 with Pierre Levegue in the Taubo Lago, and I think he made it until the the last hour and was exhausted and possibly maybe missed a shift coming into uh, coming after into Arnage, I think before White House Arnage, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the that's the most obvious and the saddest example. Levegue was already around forty years old. Can't remember exactly at the time, maybe thirty seven. Uh, and he was a veteran. He was an all round sportsman. He was a tennis player, an ice hockey player. He'd represented France at ice hockey. And he was a good amateur driver. Um, but he, he, was, he decided he wanted to win the race single-handed. And in his own Talbo, he was in the lead uh, with just over an hour to go, I think. And his wife, who was in the pits, had been trying to persuade him to you know, let his co-driver have a, have a turn because she could see he was getting more and more exhausted. And other people, uh, like Charles Farou, the race director, were getting worried about him. As, you know, they could see at the pit stops that you know, he was becoming exhausted. Um, but he wouldn't get out of the car. Uh, and uh, what it, nobody knows for sure, but it's thought that he missed a gear shift, and the engine certainly broke. And it handed the race on a plate to the two Mercedes who'd just returned to Le Mans for the first time since the war. 
with two specially built three-liter coupes, and one of them co-driven by Herman Lang, the Grand Prix champion from before the war, with Fritz Reis, they won, and with the second car as the runner-up. In general, we see the performance increase decade by decade, so that on average, they're running about 10 miles an hour faster every 10 years or so. The cars are getting better and better. Along the way, there are subtle safety improvements, perhaps not noticeable to most people. And then another interesting fact that I think you've uncovered, it might be unique to your book, is that there was a local doctor whose clinic sort of became the de facto emergency clinic for the race. Well, yes, Dr. Henri de la Genière. Uh, had set up a clinic in Le Mans. And it was the first, funnily enough, he was a gynecologist. Uh, that was his speciality. Gynecology and I think thoracic surgery. And he set up his clinic in Le Mans. It was the natural place to take injured people. And of course, there were injuries, and some of them fatal, from the very earliest years. Some of them drivers, uh, some of them spectators, although, you know, interestingly, the early spectator fatalities were people, sometimes small boys, sometimes uh, adults, who'd gone into prohibited areas. But anyway, they were taken to Dr. de la Genière's clinic throughout the decades, stitched together or sent to the mortuary, sadly. And the race, it was a dangerous race, there's no doubt about it. You know, when you've got a a straightaway, as you say, of uh, three and a half miles long, then the car's going to be reaching extraordinary speeds and holding day and night. And the organizers were very aware of that. And each year, pretty much, safety considerations were taken into account and new precautions were introduced, whether they were barriers or not having sandbanks anymore, having having metal barriers, widening the roads, easing the bends. In the early 30s, they cut off a section of the circuit that got closest to the city of Le Mans, strangely, down to a suburb called Pont Dieu, where there was a sharp hairpin bend where a lot of the early photographs of the race were taken because early cameras could cope with the low cars going around there at the hairpin at low speeds. But that was cut off because it was the only built-up area of the circuit, and the residents were complaining. So what the Automobile Club de l'Ouest did was buy a section of land from just after the end of the pits to the bit known as Tertre Rouge at the beginning of the Mulsanne Strait, and they built a section of track, which was the first bit of the circuit that was not public road. And that's the bit that goes up to what to the Dunlop Bridge, as we think of it, then came down to what was the S's, um, the original S's. Now there are curves there. And that goes to, to the what became a, a sharp right-hander at Tetra Rouge onto the main straight. And one of the reasons for doing that was uh, it was easier to build uh, spectator enclosures and sell tickets for it. You know, they'd always had a keen and very sensible eye on um, on maximizing their income, you know, partly to keep the race going and to be able to resurface the road every every year or two with improved materials. And that was a big thing. And I, you know, I think it's true that that Le Mans helped the development of, of roads in France. Because to begin with, you know, it was just pebbles and dust and they tried to bind it together with something called calcium chloride. Uh, and they'd roll that mixture. And all that did, unfortunately, when it got hot, was chloride fumes would come up and get into the driver's eyes and their nostrils, and that was a pretty unpleasant experience. So, you know, the coming of asphalt was a, was a big help. By the late 1930s, war clouds are forming. People see this coming. You have a wonderful chapter where you talk about... Th- the, some of the figures that were prominent in the pre-war years and what they did during the war. Some of them were resistance fighters. Some of them, unfortunately, lost their lives. They did, including the winner in 1939, Robert Benoit, who won in one of the beautiful Bugatti Type 57 tanks with um, Raymond Sommer. And Benoit joined the British SOE, the sort of secret service which helped the resistance 
in France. And Benoit went to London to be briefed and was dropped back into France. And eventually his network was betrayed and he was captured, along with another racing driver, uh, William Grover, who was known as Williams, who'd won the first Monaco Grand Prix in 1929. Uh, was a Bugatti Works Grand Prix driver, didn't race at the Mans. But they were both captured and both killed by the Gestapo. Uh, meanwhile, the track was being, the circuit was being obliterated by bombs, mostly Allied bombs towards the end of the war, because there, was a, there were factories and an airfield around there, and they were targets. Uh, they tried to miss... The, the Allied uh, bombing raids, they, they tried to miss the city of Le Mans itself, didn't always succeed. But the circuit itself ceased to exist. All the grandstands, the pits, everything was, uh, was blown to hell. And the Germans had actually built, at Mulsanne Corner, just outside it, they'd built a kind of prison camp. In 1949, having uh, rebuilt the circuit and the facilities, um, the ACO were worried that all they would have for the first post-war race was pre-war cars. You know, manufacturers hadn't time, had time to, to start building new cars. And all they would have on their entry list was cars that had been hidden away during the war and then dusted off and brought out again. And they didn't want that. They didn't want an old car race. So they said, OK, for the first time ever, we'll allow prototypes into the race. In other words, cars that weren't series production. So you don't have to prove how many you, you, that you've built, 25 or 200 or whatever. So that is the reason why there were two Ferraris on the grid in 1949. But Enzo Ferrari himself was uncertain about the race. He built the first car under his own name in 1947, two years earlier, and he'd already won the Mille Emilia. But he thought that Le Mans was a bit risky, and if he sent a factory entry, if it didn't do well, that would be bad publicity. But he was persuaded by his friend Luigi Kinetti, who he'd known since Kinetti was a, a mechanic at Alfa Romeo in the 1930s and had gone to America during the war and helped persuade him to build his own cars. Kinetti had now persuaded him to sell him two of his latest racing cars, two liter V12 cars, the 166 MM Barquetta open cockpit cars. Barquetta means little boat, and they look like little speedboats. So Kinetti bought two of these cars and got people who wanted to drive them to really pay most of the cost of the entry. And one of them was Lord Selston, who'd raced at Le Mans before the war. And Kinetti entered a car with himself and Selston as, as the two drivers. And perhaps not surprisingly, because the Ferrari 166MM was a proper racing car, uh, they won the race uh, against much bigger French opposition, much bigger engine cars from the old Talbots and Delahays and Delages and so on. Uh, but this neat little Ferrari was the winner, and Kinetti did almost all the driving. I mean, I think Selston only did about an hour and a half, and Kinetti was a very good driver. So that really put Ferrari on the map. Yes, and Luigi Canetti, of course, went on to become the Ferrari importer for the United States and then started the North American racing team, uh, which is legendary. Canetti, I think, is one of the great figures of Le Mans history. Uh, he wasn't officially connected with it, um, you know, but he, you know, he won it before the war. He won it after the war. Uh, he won it three times in all as a driver. And he was really responsible for bringing Ferrari to Le Mans. And, you know, as you say, he started the North American racing team, which played a very big part um, through the 60s and 70s. He brought the Rodriguez brothers, Pedro and Ricardo, the two very talented teenage Mexican brothers. He brought them to Le Mans. Ricardo was denied an entry in his first year because he was only 17 and the organizers said that was too young. Um, but he was certainly quick enough even then. And Pedro, Pedro eventually won the race. Um, in a Porsche. And um, Kinetti stayed involved for a long, long, long time and really was, I would say, you know, if you had to nominate half a dozen people who had a really significant impact on the history of the 24 hours of the Mall, Luigi Kinetti would be one of them. He was, he was born in 1901 and died in 1994. 
So his lifespan traced the entire development virtually of the automobile and so much change. And he was just in the right place at the right time with the right instincts. He was in the right place at the right time with the right instincts. And, you know, he was a great wheeler dealer. As soon as he got to America, uh, the outbreak of the war, you know, you could see he was wheeling and dealing and selling cars and just a, a, an amazing, an amazing figure. Um, but <laughs> his his relationship with Le Mans was not completely without its speed bumps. In the 90s, I think it was, he entered four cars uh, with the as four assorted Ferraris uh, under the banner of the North American racing team. And when one of them, a Dino, was, uh, he was told it couldn't race as a GT car, it had to race as a prototype because it hadn't been homologated, in other words, cleared for, um, cleared for the GT category. Uh, he withdrew all four cars immediately, you know, they were from the grid. They were, on, they were lining up on the grid, and he, and he was told, no, the Dino is racing as a prototype, not a GT car. And he pulled all four cars off the grid, and he didn't go back to Le Mans for a while. So, um, you know, it was not all sweetness and light. But he was, uh, he was a man of strong opinions and strong actions. Well said. I would love to talk a little bit about the early 50s because we have sort of a new generation coming on the scene. People like Sterling Moss, people like Juan Manuel Fangio, who was racing in the 40s, but really came into his own in the 1950s, both in Formula One and also in endurance racing, although he wasn't really a fan of Le Mans. Neither Fangio nor Sterling Moss liked Le Mans. Neither of them won it. Moss came second a number of times and was often used by his team as the hare. Uh, in other words, you know, he'd set off at a fantastic pace that couldn't possibly be kept up for 24 hours uh, in order to lure the opposition, usually Ferraris, into going too fast and to breaking their cars and of course the the penalty for that was that his car would usually break too but he'd done his job by then but neither he nor Fangio loved the race and that was because of the mix of sizes of cars you get very fast cars and very you know much much slower cars you know you might get a disparity of 80 90 miles an hour on the Mulsanne straight um, and m even more than that the divergence in the quality of the drivers, the standard of driving. You'd be coming up behind a little 750cc DB or monopole driven by somebody you'd never heard of. You know, you didn't know whether he was looking in his mirrors, whether he knew what to do when a, you know, a four and a half litre Maserati kept was coming up behind him, going 80 miles an hour faster than he was. Uh, and it's very difficult to predict the behavior of, of the amateur drivers in the smaller cars. And they saw that as a, an unacceptable risk. And other drivers, even before the war, you know, Richard Seaman, the great Englishman who drove for Mercedes before the war, he was offered a drive with Lagonda in 1938, I think. And he thought seriously about it. But he was dissuaded, partly by Mercedes, who said, why take the risk? You know, at the more it's just just too much trouble but you know in the 50s you did get all the top grand prix drivers racing there all of them which was a fantastic spectacle another newcomer to the scene in the early 50s was a tiny little car from germany porsche well porsche appeared at the beginning of the 50s with this little car uh based on the volkswagen designed by ferdinand porsche uh, looked a bit like an upturned bathtub, painted silver. The first ones had spats over the wheels, so they, you know, very aerodynamic. Little flat four engines hanging out the rear behind the rear axle. Air cooled, making a funny noise. But they went pretty quickly, and throughout the 50s, they went quicker and quicker and got, you know, better and better. And, you know, bigger and bigger, the engines got bigger. It, through the 50s into the 60s, they were mopping up class wins and by the time of the late 60s early 70s the Porsche 911 had become the kind of people's car of Le Mans there were some years when you'd have 20 of them on the grid but the Porsche works team took the event very very seriously indeed and they were building the Porsche 917 
this mighty, mighty sports car, maybe the mightiest sports car ever built. And that was a fantastic era. The Porsche 917s and the Ferrari 512s. Big sports cars built with no restrictions, basically, whatsoever, as long as they got lights. And they had great drivers, the, all, the very best drivers of the era. And that's what attracted Steve McQueen in 1970 to make his film called Le Mans, which isn't really, it's not a movie in the sense of having characters and a plot and, you know, development. It's a, it's a hymn to the Porsche 917 and the Ferrari 512 and to Le Mans and to the circuit, really. And that's what you watch it for. You watch it for the amazing footage of those cars going round. I think it was kind of an excuse for McQueen to go racing at Le Mans. Yeah, and I think it was a great sadness to him that his insurers wouldn't allow him to take part in the race itself. He'd driven at Sebring in the 12 hours and came second, did very well. And, uh, you know, he had a bit of experience and he could probably have coped with it, but he wasn't allowed to. So he had to content himself with directing the film. You know, people still watch it with great pleasure but not for the characterizations and the, the love story at the heart of the film. I think the Porsche story is one of the greatest stories of Le Mans, how they progressed little by little through the 50s and 60s to finally win outright. And one of the figures who was important to that effort was Hushka von Hanstein, who had raced at Le Mans himself, I think in the late 30s, right? But then he, he worked for Porsche in the 1950s onward. Yeah, uh, von Hanstein was the racing director in the 1950s. In fact, in the late 30s, um, he, he'd rather embarrassed himself by, he was racing in an Adler with his girlfriend, um, a French woman called Anne-Cécile Rosetier. And um, he forgot to top up the oil at one stop and then realized, called in and topped up the oil. And the commissaires told him, sorry, you're not allowed to come back in and top up. We're disqualifying you. And his girlfriend was furious. So that was not a very good um, introduction to Le Mans. But he was there throughout the 50s and throughout the, uh, and the, the 60s. And Porsche's rise from the 1100cc class to dominance, absolute dominance of the, of the overall uh, category winning year after year. So many great careers with Porsche at Le Mans. Guys like Brian Redman, Derek Bell. Of course, you mentioned the Rodriguez brothers already. Vic Elford, Jackie Ix. Let's talk about Jackie Ix. Well, Jackie Ix was, until Tom Christensen came along, Jackie Ix was Mr. Le Mans, Monsieur Le Mans, because he won the race six times, most often in Porsches. You know, uh, a very handsome young Belgian who'd uh, been a star in Formula One, was expected to win the world championship with Ferrari, won Grand Prix, but never quite won the championship, but then really defined his career at Le Mans. Uh, he was a beautiful driver, very fast, very smooth, um, very determined, uh, aggressive when he needed to be. Um, you know, one year his own car retired. Uh, he was put into the second Porsche and he went from last to win the race uh, through the night, um, you know, driving stint after stint after stint. And he could do that. Uh, but he could also, you know, he was, <laughs> uh, he was the man who um, really put an end to the famous Le Mans start. Yes, of course, because the, the Le Mans start was what, what the drivers would do. They would assemble across the track from the cars and they would have to run to the cars, start them up and go. And that was a tradition for decades. Even now, when somebody wants to use a single photograph that sums up Le Mans, makes or evokes the, the, the spirit of Le Mans, they use a picture of one of the old starts with the drivers beginning their sprint across the track from their little white circles painted on the other side of the, of the road. You know, and all sorts of funny things happened at Le Mans starts. Drivers would, Fangio once got the gear lever stuck up the leg of his pants, so it got away nearly last. Sterling Moss used to train for the start, used to train himself for a, that little 15-yard sprint across the track. But Jackie Eakes really put an end to it. He thought it was a bad idea. He thought it was dangerous. 
And as the cars got bigger and faster, he was probably right, you know, starting 55 or 60 cars in a herringbone formation, um, getting them all away without incident was probably beginning to ask too much. So what he did in 1969 when he was driving a Ford GT40 was to refuse to run across the track. He took up his position, but while everybody else was sprinting, he strolled. And he strolled across to his GT40, opened the door, got in, closed the door, started the car up and set off right at the back of the field and eventually won the race. And he'd made his point. The organisers, I think very reluctantly, saw that the Le Mans start now belonged to history. Uh, in fact, the, n the next year they started with the cars still lined up in herringbone formation, but with the drivers in the cars. Uh, and then they had to start their engines and set off. But then that wasn't much better, they thought. So eventually they went to a two-by-two two rolling start, such as we have today, uh, a sort of Indianapolis-style start. But, you know, a lot of people were very sad to see the end of that old, wonderful tradition. Coming into the 1970s, the gas crisis influenced auto racing. There were new sort of economy standards instituted and uh, displacements went down. Uh, it sort of changed the face of racing for a time, at least until turbocharging came around and became popular. Yes. Um, since that first fuel crisis in the mid-1970s, fuel economy has always been in the minds of the organizers, more or less stringently. Sometimes, you know, it's reduced the race to effectively a fuel economy run, which has been not good. But then they've found ways to, to get away from that and to um, to make it a proper contest again. Um, nobody wants to see cars droning around saving fuel uh, for 24 hours. You're right, turbos introduced a, a spectacular element. Uh, turbo engines don't generally sound so great, but they do make flames and they make kind of weird whistling and woofling noises, which uh, have an appeal of their own. You know, and then came hybrids, another element of technology. Le Mans has always striven to put a priority on technical innovation to the benefit of motoring. Ever since the beginning of, uh, of Le Mans, people have tried new ways of... Uh, building cars. Eventually, of course, at Le Mans, they created the thing called Garage 56, which um, is an entry given to a car purely on the basis of what it has to offer in terms of technical innovation. And that's led to some very interesting things. Uh, before it was formalized, there were the Rover BRM gas turbine cars in the 60s, you know, which was an interesting experiment. In the end, it didn't prove to have a real application to road cars, but it was worth a try. And, you know, Jackie Stewart and Graham Hill made one go pretty quickly in the 60s. And there have been many other interesting experiments like the Delta Wing and the Zeod and all sorts of strange looking things. The Nardi twin boom car in the mid 50s, which had the driver in one bit of fuselage and the engine in another bit that looked like two cigar tubes joined together by a matchbox. I think not very interesting to drive because it got blown off the Mulsan straight when a, fast, a bigger, faster car went past and its backwash blew it into the scenery. But, you know, those kinds of innovations, aerodynamic all sorts of things have been a, an intrinsic part of um, of the history of Le Mans. A couple of others of note. We, we already talked a little bit about the Bugatti tanks, which were an attempt at streamlining. But there was also Briggs Cunningham's Le Monster Cadillac, which is probably the ugliest car ever to race at Le Mans. And then, of course, there was the diminutive Deutsche Bonnet cars and the Gordinis. And Amade Gordini was... Uh, an Italian who emigrated to France changed his name from Amadeo, the Italian, to Amade, and he had a long and successful run at Le Mans. Yes, Gordini was, I mean, he was known as Le Saucier, the sorcerer, because he was brilliant at um, breathing on engines to make them go quicker. And he began with Simca, and he had a partnership with Simca, so he built kind of little racing engines 
coupes and um, spiders from Gordini parts or, originally. And gradually they, they became more and more Gordinis, less and less Simca. And he raced some in, in uh, Grand Prix races, but sports car racing was really his thing. And the sad thing is that um, he never won Le Mans outright, although once or twice he really looked like doing so. But, you know, Gordini was never really adequately financed. Uh, he was always short of money. The, <laughs> and he was always short of time, too, very often, year after year. The car, the, his his best car, wouldn't be finished until the eve of the race, and it had to be driven from the factory in the southern suburbs of Paris. It had to be driven the hundred odd kilometers down to Le Mans, just squeaking in to get into scrutineering with you know minutes to spare, and sometimes too late even. And you know it would have to be driven down by one of the race drivers uh, to get it down there fast enough, with no number plates, registration plates on, or anything, just um, in pure race trim. But you could do that on the roads of Europe in those days. But it's sad that he didn't win it because he made lovely cars and he had very good drivers, and he had he had bad luck. But the cars probably weren't quite robust enough. Yeah, I think of. Uh... Gordini in the same vein as, you know, Carlo Abarth and even to an extent, a guy like Donald Healy, you know, they were always suffering from a lack of funds. Absolutely right. Uh, and that was part of the romance of it. You know, you, you, you saw these guys scratching around building their lovely cars. And is this the year when they're going to justify it all and fighting against the odds against much bigger manufacturers? Um, you mentioned Briggs Cunningham earlier. I think Cunningham was fantastically important at Le Mans. You know, he, he turned up for the first time at the beginning of the 1950s, you know, at a time when Europe was emerging from the horror and the privation of war, rationing, all that sort of thing. And Briggs Cunningham turned up with his cars painted white and blue, with crates full of spares, with a you know, huge cast of mechanics and other people, and himself. And he was a glamorous figure. And he brought a kind of Hollywood glamour. He wasn't a Hollywood figure, but he brought a breath of that to Le Mans. And looking back, reading the French newspapers from the time, you know, when ever, his arrival from, you know, an ocean liner with his crew and his cars was such an event. I mean, the, one of the headlines in the Le Mans paper one year, in like 52 or 53, was, now Briggs Cunningham has arrived, Le Mans can begin. And it was like that. It was like, you know, it's a bit like film stars arriving at, from Hollywood at the Cannes Film Festival, you know, surrounded by paparazzi. And Cunningham was that kind of figure. He brought glamour and wealth and a sense of good times. And the appearance of Americans at Le Mans, especially American cars, has been a fairly rare thing. Uh, in the, let's see, I think in the 30s, there were Chryslers racing at Le Mans, some Stutzes. Oh, yeah, there were, yeah. It, it, it's a rare event when an American car shows up. And, of course, Briggs Cunningham was committed to building his own cars for the race. Yes, and with big American V8 engines as well. That was a big thing. That became a part of, uh, of Le Mans. You weren't getting the sort of scream of European engines, you, you know, purebred racing engines. You were getting the, the rumble and the roar of these, you know, big American V8s. And, you know, we still have the Corvettes there today. And that's, you know, they may not have the same kind of engines, but they carry the same spirit with them. And that, you know, through the Ford years, the Cobra years, all those things, uh, and then the early Corvettes, you know, they were hugely popular with the French crowds. You know, it meant a lot to them to have these, these American cars there. Because, Amer you know, after the war, France was, you know, the old culture of France, you know, music with accordions, chaps wearing berets, you know, that was falling away and you know they were trying to get their desperate to get their hands on blue jeans and chewing gum and rock and roll you know uh, france was falling in love with all that and briggs cunningham and then the chevrolet corvettes and then the fords you know they tapped into that 
Richard, we're at uh, six minutes before the hour right now. We've barely begun. <laughs> no, I know. See, this is the challenge. There's so much to cover, and we're we're, we're just not going to do it all. But I think, I think we need a few minutes at least on the 1955 Le Mans disaster. Sure. It's so significant, and it changed so much. Took Mercedes Benz out of racing for decades. Uh, yes, it was something that were it to happen today would put an end to motorsport. Those were different times. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it was only 10 years after the end of a world war in which millions had been killed. So there was a slightly different attitude to, to death, even violent death. The organizers were, of course, criticized uh, when they didn't stop the race. Um, the accident had happened after just over six hours. Uh, so there was still 18 hours to go, nearly. Um, but they didn't stop it, and they didn't stop it for a very good reason, because they were getting on for a quarter of a million people uh, in the circuit, in the grounds. And if they'd stopped it, they would all have headed for the exit. And the terrible jams would have prevented emergency vehicles, ambulances, from getting in and out and taking the, the wounded, um, injured people to the hospital. Um, so they allowed it to carry on, of course. A lot of people around the circuit barely knew that anything had happened at all. It took quite a long time for the for the news to get to get round. Although the the dead and wounded were cleared within half an hour of the accident happening, and the race was just able to carry on. But of course, there was a great storm of criticism afterwards and horror expressed. Well, understandably, it was a terrible thing, uh, and there were inquiries into how it had happened and whose fault it was, and lots of rumours about why it had happened, many of them false. It seemed very clear now that what happened was Mike Hawthorne in his D-type Jaguar was leading the race a few seconds ahead of Juan Manuel Fangio in the leading Mercedes. And Hawthorne was about to make a pit stop and he was, you know, racing Fangio. He was, you know, going full out. And just before the pits, he overtook the much slower Austin Healy of an English driver called Lance Macklin. Macklin was keeping to the right of the track as they approached the pitch, as slower car pits, as slower cars were supposed to do. Fast cars were supposed to overtake on the left. Hawthorne was on the left, but he wanted to come into his pits. So he cut in, in front of Macklin, and braked heavily to, so that he could stop at the pit. The Jaguar had disc brakes. The Austin Healy had drum brakes, much less efficient. Uh, we can only assume that Hawthorne braked so abruptly that Macklin locked his brakes and swerved to the left. Coming up behind him, a lap behind Hawthorne, was Pierre Levegue in another of the Mercedes. Macklin had swerved across the track. Levegue didn't have room to pass. Yeah, and Macklin's Austin Healy acted as a ramp as he came up behind him and just launched him into the waddle, as we call it, the the cane and earthen barriers to the left. But as it came down, the car also hit a kind of concrete abutment. Um, that's right. Beside a tunnel. And that's what really made it disintegrate. And bits of it, the front axle assembly, the engine, flew into the spectator enclosure in front of the grandstand. Spectators were still crowded, packed together, even six hours after the start of the race. 83 spectators were killed and Levegue was killed. Hawthorne and Macklin were unhurt. And uh, as I said, the race continued while the terrible carnage was uh, dealt with. Levegue was blamed immediately, but it wasn't his fault at all. He, could, he was helpless. He could do nothing. Um, he was traveling much faster than, uh, than Macklin. Uh, you know, he would have normally got, lapped him perfectly straightforwardly but there was no space for him to to go through and you know entire books have been written about the 1955 crash analyzing it from every perspective i wondered what i could do that would add a perspective to it maybe i looked at the list of dead and injured the complete lists which were published in le Mans libre the local paper over the following days and i found the youngest um, there's an 11 year old boy called Pierre Rouchy who lived in a, a nearby village called Ecomois. 
um, just beyond Milsan. He lived there with his family and attended a local Catholic high school in Le Mans. Eleven years old, he'd had his first communion a couple of weeks earlier uh, with the rest of his class and had their picture taken, a class photograph, um, where they're all sitting, bright young boys, smiling. And he went with his family to the race. You know, it was a big treat. Went with his uh, brother and sister and his parents. And after the first four or five hours, he asked his father if he could get a bit closer. They were in the enclosure in front of the grandstands, opposite the pits, just at the beginning of the pits. And he was killed. The rest of his family were uninjured. They were standing elsewhere. And I thought to tell the story of the, the youngest victim, you know, we all might have been that boy at some point in our lives. And particularly in that era, there were very few safety precautions either for the drivers or the spectators. Anything might have happened to any of us. So that boy sort of symbolized all of us who fell in love with the sport. And it was his tragedy to be a victim of that. In hindsight, it was a bit of a ticking time bomb based on the design of that pit straight and the spectator area and how narrow the track was at that point. The disaster prompted many changes. Of course, all that entire area was bulldozed and redesigned. Mercedes-Benz left motor racing for many years. Um, they continued in rallying, but they weren't in Grand Prix or endurance racing, sports car racing. And the Mercedes team in the middle of the night finally did decide to withdraw and were still leading at that point, I believe. And Mike Hawthorne went on to win, but he was roundly criticized in the press, especially the French press, savaged him. And the debate has raged ever since about who to point the finger at. But the official inquiry essentially said this was a cascade of events that no one person was responsible for. Uh, yes, of course. Mercedes withdrew after... You know, there'd been several hours of discussions at board level back in in, uh, in Stuttgart at Mercedes headquarters. You know, the bald fact was that 10 years after the end of a war in which German troops had occupied Le Mans and in which there'd been, you know, <laughs> a lot of death and destruction, 83 spectators, most of them French, were lying dead on French soil, killed by German machinery. The accident was in no way Mercedes-Benz's fault, but they felt they had to withdraw, and I'm sure they really did not have an option. And they would have won the race. They were in the lead. And Hawthorne and Ivor Buer had been there. Jaguar went on to win it. And it was a very muted finish. There's no doubt about that. You know, it, it had rained the next morning. It was, you know gray, dull day. People knew by then what had happened. You know, they'd had hours to absorb and process the catastrophe. So when the race ended, you know, it was not with the usual celebration. Nevertheless, Hawthorne was handed a bottle of champagne as he sat in the Jaguar and Bueb sat alongside him on the bodywork. Hawthorne smiled and was caught by a camera smiling. And who knows what was going through his mind. He wouldn't have thought that he'd caused anything, even though it was his action that set off the chain of events. He was a pretty happy-go-lucky type. You know, if he'd been a bit older, he would have been a Spitfire pilot in, in the war, no doubt about that. You know, the archetypal, you know, kind of beer-drinking, rugby-playing type. Not particularly reflective person. So it was easy to bear down on him. Richard, talk a little bit about the modern era at Le Mans. Certainly many things have changed. Safety being number one. What do you find interesting about the modern era? It's still very spectacular. You know, you go and stand at Tetra Rouge on the outside or the inside, and you watch the big cars going by and listen to them. And it's as thrilling as it must have been in the 1930s to, to see the Alphas and Bugattis and Lagondas. Uh, and then in the 50s to see the Ferraris and Jaguars. Is the challenge the same when you have three or four drivers even 
sharing the load between them for 24 hours, whereas, you know, it used to be restricted to two. Um, I'm not sure. They have a lot more to think about, you know, if you look at the cockpit of a modern sports racing car, uh, a prototype compared to uh, a D-type Jaguar or a Ferrari Testarossa. You know, you do, you, you've just got a lot more switches and dials and, you know, and you've got you've got a crew chief talking to you through your headphones. And, you know, it's the demands are different. Uh, but is Tom Christensen not as good a driver as Jackie Eakes or Wolf Barnato? I wouldn't like to make that claim. You know, Christensen won the race nine times. He's, a, you know, an all-time great. And, you know, so are all these guys who register multiple wins like Brendan Hartley and Sebastian Buemi and Kamui Kobayashi who set the fastest lap in practice so many times for Toyota. Where where it does lose a bit of its charm is when there's only one manufacturer competing for the overall victory. You know, the Audi string of 13 wins in 15 years, that went on a bit too long. Um, it needed somebody to come in and disrupt that. You know, it's a tribute to the genius of the team directors. Wolfgang Ulrich, the technical director at Audi, made the brilliant decision. You know, when something small breaks, don't just fiddle around changing the small thing. Change the, that whole bit of the car. Change the whole front end or the whole rear end. And build the car so that you can change those things really quickly. Uh, you know, it's been very interesting to see the, you know, the French come back occasionally with... The year Re Renault won was very exciting. Uh, then when Peugeot came back a couple of times and, and won, that's very good for French enthusiasm, for you know, for home interest in the race. And it, you know, the Peugeot are back now, and you know, you can only hope that they make their rather unorthodox new uh, hypercar go a bit faster than it's been going so far, um, because that hypercar category now is very exciting. You know, we're at the end of five years of Toyota dominance, not the most interesting period in the history of Le Mans, once they'd finally won it after years of coming second and, you know, having terrific problems and, you know, agony to watch them. You know, they lost the race on the last lap, which was, you know, a real heartbreaker. And then they finally won it, and then they won it four more times. But now they need a challenge, and it looks like this year, as Le Mans celebrates its centenary, that they're going to get that challenge, you know, from Porsche and Ferrari and Cadillac and maybe Glickenhaus and maybe Van Wall and maybe Peugeot, which would be great. It'd be great to have a home team. I have to tell you, I'm very excited to watch the Glickenhaus team. I've kind of been following them closely and, you know, they're, they are a privateer and that is interesting. There's very little of that anymore. The Glickenhaus team has a lot of appeal to me, partly because, you know, it's an, a, an, a buccaneering American coming across to France to race at Le Mans, you know, which has echoes of Briggs Cunningham. I guess Glickenhaus is a very different guy from Cunningham, but, you know, the idea is the same. And, you know, he's building his own car. Um, and, you know, good luck to him. I, I, you know, I really hope they do well. I hope they make progress. Um, and I hope they don't get swamped by all the big manufacturers coming in. I hope they can they can hold their own because um, that's the kind of thing that makes Le Mans Le Mans. Well, whether you're a well-initiated Le Mans fan or this is a new thing for you, there's something in the book that's going to be fascinating. It's called 24 Hours, 100 Years of Le Mans. Richard Williams, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Maurice. It's been a great pleasure to come on and talk about it. That's all for this episode of Horsepower Heritage. If you like what you've heard, go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash HP Heritage and support the show. Tell your friends, write a review because all of that helps me reach more gearheads like you. And there's more for you over on the YouTube channel and on Instagram and at horsepowerheritage.com. I'll see you back here on Wednesday, June 14th, when we'll be talking about the art and science of keeping old cars on the road and passing those skills on to the next generation. So until then, I'm Maurice Merrick. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.